A black van pulls up to Lufthansa Airlines storage area. Three men enter the building while the getaway van is brought around to the back. They burst in, wielding guns, round up all the night shift employees, and handcuff them. They force a supervisor to open the vault so that they don't set off any alarms. The contents are loaded into the van and the crew drives away into the night with nearly $6 million in untraceable cash and jewels, worth roughly $23.4 million today. If they would have gotten away with it, it would have been one of the world's greatest heists. In today's post 9-11 world of constant surveillance, especially in airports, it's difficult to imagine that New York was once the land of opportunity for anyone with the nerve to knock over the city's top dollar targets. The largest heist of these by far was the Lufthansa heist, which is also the largest heist ever committed in the name of the American Mafia. The heist began with Louis Werner, an employee of the German Lufthansa airline who had a severe gambling problem. He and his co-worker, Peter Grunwald, had long been planning to steal from one of the airline's regular shipments of cash. The guys knew they couldn't do this on their own, so they decided to secretly spread the word about this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Louis Werner told Martin Krugman, who was $20,000 in debt due to gambling. He saw this as an opportunity to make back all of his money. He took this information to his acquaintance, Henry Hill, who worked closely with Jimmy the Gent Burke, a known associate of the Lucchese crime family and a proficient robber. Burke offered to organize the heist for a sizable cut. Before we get into the heist itself, let's learn a little bit more about the characters involved. Henry Hill was a local Brooklyn gangster and drug dealer, and was part of the Lucchese crime family, one of Brooklyn's most notorious mafia families. His father was Irish and his mother was Sicilian. He got involved with the mob at a young age. As a teenager, he would run errands for the gangsters that hung out around his house in Brownsville. And as he got older, he graduated to more serious crimes, including arson. Hill was told about the heist by one of the men he collected protection payments from, Martin Krugman, a Russian Jewish man who owned a wig shop and a hair salon. Hill swore that he never killed anyone, but he openly admitted to witnessing 20 murders and helping bury the bodies of at least 10 victims. He served some time in prison, but it was for extortion, never for any violent crime. Jimmy Burke had a rough childhood, which is probably one of the factors that contributed to criminal behavior later in life. Burke was abused by the foster families he lived with for the first 13 years of his life, after his birth mother abandoned him at an orphanage at the age of two. He eventually found loving adoptive parents, but the mold had been cast. After so many years of beatings, Burke spent most of his teenage years and early 20s in and out of prison. Jimmy delighted in murder, and was responsible for many of the bodies that Hill had to bury. Burke usually buried the bodies locally. He scattered them underneath houses, bocce ball courts, and even his own bar. He was known as the Gent because he passed out wads of cash and tips to everyone whenever he entered a room. In the years that followed, he worked mainly for the New York Mafia families, specifically the Lucchese and Colombo crime families. He was Irish American, so he couldn't become a made man. Only Italians could earn that privilege. He committed all sorts of crimes, but his specialty was stealing. Werner gave the mobsters a sketch of the building's layout and alarm systems so that they could get familiar with it. Despite Burke's doubts about Krugman's reasons for approaching them, the opportunity seemed too good to pass up. After planning it out in his Queen's restaurant, Burke handpicked a crew of associates and went out to the Lufthansa cargo terminal at JFK Airport in the early morning of December 11, 1978. The heist was relatively simple. The mobsters wore ski masks and burst into the cargo area. They took one Lufthansa employee hostage and rounded up everybody else. The mobsters then captured the cargo agent and threatened him into calling Rudy Eirich, the night shift cargo traffic manager. He asked him to come upstairs where two armed men were waiting for him. They got him to open the vault without setting off any of the alarms. The men grabbed 72 boxes of cash and all the jewelry they could find and made their escape. It took just over an hour and the crew was gone before 4.30 in the morning, well before sunrise. They left with the getaway van and met Burke in Brooklyn where they transferred all the money and went their separate ways. The heist made international headlines for not only how much was stolen, but soon enough, how little the police knew about it. It stayed that way for a long time, in part because of the murders that followed it. The heist had gone off perfectly except for one little mistake, 
made by the getaway driver, Edward Stax Parnell. Instead of taking the getaway vehicle to a mob-owned scrapyard in New Jersey, he left it parked outside of his girlfriend's house in Canarsie, Brooklyn. The oversight sent Burke into a paranoid frenzy. Burke spent part of the 70s in jail. However, he was never prosecuted for his biggest crimes even after he went down years later for fixing college basketball games. He was never tried for all of the murders that he committed. The reason why he was never tried for the Lufthansa heist, however, is quite different. After he had Edwards killed, Burke methodically signed death warrants for every mobster involved in the heist. He didn't care if they were close friends or merely associates. Guys like Joe Buda Monry and Robert McMahon, who had both planned the heist, wound up with bullets in the back of their heads. Guys like Marty Krugman were taken out for other reasons, such as his demand for nearly half a million dollars. Louis Cafora, who bought his wife a pink Cadillac right after he got paid, mysteriously disappeared, and his body has never been found. In the meantime, Thomas De Simone, a close friend of Burke and co-conspirator in the heist, was killed by the Gambino family as revenge for a murder that De Simone had committed. Burke also had one of his closest colleagues, Richard Eaton, killed because he had ripped Burke off for nearly $250,000 in a drug scam, and he had also been taking money off the top when the Lufthansa heist money had been laundered. Burke and Hill were eventually arrested and went to jail, but it was for something unrelated to the Lufthansa heist. The only person to ever serve time for the Lufthansa heist was Louis Werner. He was sentenced to 15 years for tipping off Burke and Hill. Burke's goal was to kill off every possible witness, and he nearly succeeded. So how do we have all this information? Hill was arrested for dealing drugs and for his involvement in the Lufthansa heist. He decided to become a government informant because he didn't really have any other option. Burke was going to kill him whether he was on the streets or in prison. Hill's testimony led to 50 convictions, including Burke's for rigging college basketball games. But Burke was never charged for anything related to the Lufthansa heist. He died in prison from cancer on April 13, 1996. Henry Hill, his wife Karen, and their two children entered the Witness Protection Program after his testimony. Vincent Asara was another organizer of the Lufthansa heist. Though suspected, he was never convicted due to a lack of evidence. However, in 2017, Vincent Asara was sentenced to 96 months imprisonment for arson after he burned a man's car who had cut him off on the Brooklyn streets. In sentencing, Judge Ross found that Asara was a longtime member of the Bonanno crime family, who had participated in the 1969 murder of Paul Katz, the 1978 robbery of the Lufthansa airline, and that as of 2013, Paul Katz was actively involved in loan sharking. He was found not guilty for all of these crimes. What they thought would be a $2 million heist ended up being a $5 million heist, with nearly $850,000 worth of jewelry. In today's dollars, that's nearly $23 million. At the time, it was the biggest heist in American history, and as such, it was subject to a massive FBI investigation and countless movies and books in the decades that followed. Six people with ties to the heist have wound up murdered, according to the Times. Others have been placed in witness protection program in exchange for their cooperation. Most of the money has never been recovered.